Hi, welcome to the third session in History of World Revolutions. Last time we were looking at the first of the early modern revolutions and the first of the revolutions that we've looked at in the course, which is the English Civil War. And in the case of the English Civil War, I think it was relatively easy to lay out uh, some of the causes and goals of the revolution in terms of religious issues as well as economic issues, the rise of capitalism in the British countryside, uh, political issues in regards to uh, the power of the monarchy and what was to be done about that. But today, in looking at what I call the American revolutions, and I'll explain that in a moment, uh, the first of those revolutions, so the one that we all think of as the American Revolution in the 18th century, it's going to be somewhat more difficult uh, to clearly define some of those same aspects of causes and effects. Uh, as we will see, we don't have quite the same social structure in North America in the British colonies as we have in England and even France in the 18th century. There is no formal aristocracy, people who have titles. Uh, we have rule by the monarchy, but the monarchy is at least one step removed because the monarchy is over in England and here we're talking about North America. In terms of goals for people other than freeing themselves from British rule, uh, it was not always clear overtly what the revolution was about. There's a great deal of writing about you know, achieving independence from Great Britain, but other than that, were there other goals, were there other aspirations? As we will see today, there were indeed, and there were dramatic changes affecting the colonial societies before the revolution that play themselves out in the revolution itself. So it becomes more than just freeing themselves from British rule. It leads to a series of significant changes within American society itself. And the other distinction today is that we're not going to be talking about historical backgrounds in the first half and then revolution in the second half. We're really talking about two revolutions. And in part, of course, we don't need a lot of historical background since this is uh, U.S. history and as a result everyone gets their fill, <laughs> whether you like it or not, of U.S. history. So you're pretty well aware of the basics of American colonization and what was happening in American society. But we're really going to be looking at two revolutions today. The first, the traditional American Revolution of the 18th century, and then the second one, uh, the American Civil War, which, of course, most people really don't see as a revolution. They simply see it as a division between North and South over especially the issue of slavery, but also the issue of states' rights, etc. We're going to look at it in a very different way today and see that, in many ways, the American Civil War was a continuation of the American Revolution, that forces that were changing American society that burst to the surface during the first American Revolution uh, would find much of their fulfillment in the second American Revolution, and that both of them radically altered American society. To begin, in looking at that first American Revolution, we have a number of different ways we can try to characterize this first American Revolution, and one is distinctive compared to the English Civil War that we looked at last time and the French Revolution that we'll look at next time, and that is that it had an element of anti-colonialism. In other words, perhaps the primary intent of the revolutionaries was to end British colonial rule in the 13 North American colonies. This is unique among the early modern revolutions, but as we will see when we get to the 20th century revolutions, most of them have this as a central factor. People trying to throw off external rule, or if not formal external rule that we can call colonialism, then at least uh, domination from the outside from another country. So what is distinctive about the American Revolution as an early modern revolution, its anti-colonialism, uh, becomes a common characteristic in most of the 20th century revolutions we're going to look at later. Another way of characterizing the American Revolution is as an, an anti-monarchial revolution. In other words, uh, in throwing off British rule, the other thing that the American revolutionaries did was to create a government structure which eliminated monarchy altogether. If the English Civil War had radically restructured the power of the monarchy and put the bulk of state power in the parliament, 
Now the Americans were going to go much further than that. They were going to eliminate monarchy altogether and create a republican form of government where you have representatives elected and an executive that is elected as well. So here is another revolutionary aspect of the American Revolution in the 18th century. What seems to be sort of passe now, so what's the big deal? Okay, you created a system with a president in it. There was no such system at this time for all intents and purposes around the globe. The idea that you have an elected executive, an elected representative branch, a legislative branch, and this is how government is run. There is no monarchy. Uh, there is no divine right ordination of this individual. Uh, totally uh, out of character uh, with the way societies had been ruled down to the 18th century. The other question that we can raise about how to characterize this revolution is whether it's a bourgeois revolution, meaning does it represent another example as the English Civil War did and as the French Revolution will of this group coming to power in a society, the people who are going to make capitalism work in the modern world? Is that what this revolution is about? It's certainly not the way most Americans think of it. They think of, oh, well, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, we're fighting for our independence, okay, and we want a republican form of government. But the idea that we're creating capitalism uh, hardly ever enters into the considerations of people who look at the American Revolution. And yet it's a real aspect of this revolution. Capitalism didn't just happened to occur, as we saw in the English Civil War. It needs protections. It needs a legal system that protects private property. It needs other kinds of support from the state system itself in order to survive and prosper. So it just doesn't happen. You know, it just doesn't grow like topsy. It needs an input. It needs assistance from the political system. To what extent that happened in the American Revolution is one of the issues we'll look at today as we examine the first of the American Revolutions. To do that, we do need a little bit of sort of historical background. You know, what was America like without a revolution, before the revolution? And here, it can honestly be said that America fulfilled the stereotypes that exist about it. The sort of Jeffersonian ideal of a small farmer colonial society. In the years before the American Revolution, 80% of all of the people uh, in the 13 colonies were supported economically by family farms. It's 80% of them. In other words, not just farmers, but their families, uh, dependents, uh, extended family, possibly an employee here or there. 80% of the people in the colonies got their support from the family farm. It was the basic social and economic institution of colonial American society. This society of yeoman farmers, and that's what yeoman farmers really are, they're small-scale farmers, uh, family farmers, they're not peasants, they have their own land, but at the same time they are not large-scale commercial producers. They are primarily uh, subsistence producers. In other words, most of what they do uh, is to provide sufficient nourishment for themselves and their families. Now there is some degree of a market economy at this time. Uh, there are certainly exchanges of goods. Farmers would trade goods with each other. They would go to markets and trade goods for other products. There's a lot of bartering going on, in other words. But there's very little in the way of commercial agriculture. There is some. Uh, if you look along the Connecticut River, the Hudson River, the major rivers in the Northeast, uh, near to large urban areas, uh, you will find people that are growing crops on a regular basis in order to feed the cities. Uh, that a part of what they do is to grow things that they can sell for simply the purpose of selling them and securing money. But even the people who do this usually don't do it as their primary activity. In other words, much of what they do is simply to produce products for themselves, and then as a sideline, they'll also grow some things that they can sell in the city. So there's some commercial agriculture, but it is not the dominant force in the American countryside in the 18th century. This is the sort of Jeffersonian ideal of uh, self-sustaining small family farmers. Now, while that's the bulk of the population in terms of the source of their economic well-being, there are, of course, elites in this society as well. 
uh, particularly the great merchants. Uh, in the north, in the northeast, people like John Hancock, who, yeah, yes, I know, maybe he sells insurance now. But in the old days, uh, people like Hancock were involved in international trade. And much of that would be with England, some of it with the Caribbean, and they were a wealthy elite. If you really wanted to make a lot of money, this is one of the ways you could do that in colonial America. Now, there are other merchants, of course, people who trade goods in the cities and the towns or who uh, roam the countryside uh, as peddlers uh, selling products. But these people are much further down on the economic scale. The big dollars are international. This is where these great merchants make their money. And they are certainly part of an American elite. Uh, Britain rules politically. But in terms of the social order, clearly, and the economic order, clearly these people are near the top. There is also, uh, in the American South, the great planter class. Okay? Washington, Jefferson, the Lee family, the, that's where these people had their economic and social origins, as the owners of great plantations in the American South, and of course, slave owners as well, because the plantations increasingly depended upon the use of Africans in slavery, in bondage, in order to make this plantation system function. So we have the vast majority of the population in the status of small family farmers, but we do have this elite at the top uh, of great merchants and great planters who tend to dominate economically and socially. Uh, as far as a working class, almost non-existent. I mean, there are, I suppose we could count sailors and people who are day laborers in the cities who help move goods off the wharves. Uh, there are artisans who uh, produce specialty goods. But again, they're a small fraction of the total population. As far as American society as a whole, this is not the kind of aristocratic society that England was at the time of the English Civil War in the 17th century. Although the aristocracy continued to flourish in England itself, although with some different goals than in the past, they had moved away from feudalism towards capitalism. Uh, nevertheless, uh, that idea of titled individuals who hand down titles of nobility, who belong to a special class above and beyond everyone else simply by the basis of their birth, that did not translate to the New World, partly because those people didn't have to come here. Why bother? I mean, we've got all we need here. We're living in a mansion. We're living in a great manor house in the countryside. Why would I trek off you know, to the wilderness of North America uh, to make my fortune? I've already got my fortune right here. So we don't see a great transference. It's not to say that no one of uh, noble lineage uh, settled in America. But this is not essentially a society characterized by a blood aristocracy. It is instead an aristocracy of gentlemen. And I say gentlemen because it was men uh, and not women. The role of women was considered to be supportive, but subordinate by all means uh, in 18th century America. These are people who, yes, probably have some wealth uh, earned by themselves or by their fathers, their forefathers, what have you, people like Washington, Jefferson, Hancock, who have education and who have the kinds of social standing in society that entitles them to be considered gentlemen. Okay, so they can put together uh, birth, perhaps, although that's not always an absolute necessity, some wealth, certainly education, and a general sense that they are among the more refined and civilized members of society. And that, therefore, uh, they should be looked to uh, in issues that require important public consideration. As much as we have town meetings in New England, etc., the fact is uh, these people expect to be treated with a certain degree of deference, that their opinions matter more than other people's opinions because they are gentlemen. They are from the upper crust of society. Again, it's not an aristocracy with titles, but these people definitely see themselves as superior. Uh, it may not be in a case as in England where people would say, look, I'm better than you are simply because I'm born with this title, I'm born into this family, and you are a lower level of human being. But here, these people do consider themselves to be better. Look, I've got a better education than you do. Okay? 
I have more money than you do, so clearly I'm better than you are. This is the type of aristocracy that exists uh, in the American colonies in the 18th century. It is, in fact, uh, as I describe here at the top of this outline, a monarchical patriarchal society. Besides this informal aristocracy, this aristocracy of gentlemen, well-educated, civilized, well-heeled individuals. It's a society clearly that is dominated by a monarchy. It may be far removed on the other side of the Atlantic, but the government is a government uh, established and controlled by the crown. That's how governors are appointed. The official church of England, the Anglican church, is the official church of the North American colonies. Uh, this issue that was resolved uh, back during the English Civil War uh, remains uh, with the same type of compromise that existed then, and that is the Anglican church remains the official church. Yes, there are all kinds of dissenters. There are Puritans and there are Quakers, etc., but there is still a formal state church, the Anglican church, and the government, the governors, etc., are appointed directly by the monarchy. It is also a patrimonial society. And what does that mean? Patrimonial societies are societies which are vertical in their orientation, where people rely upon the patronage of their social and economic betters to get along. American society is a society that reflects the changes wrought in England by the Civil War. In other words, careers are open to talent. You are not doomed to be at the bottom or the middle of society generation after generation if, in fact, you have the talents to move up. You can make progress. You can move up in American society. But to do that takes the patronage of people above you. If you're going to get ahead, you're going to need help. If you're a local farmer, you look to perhaps the great estate owner, a plantation owner, like a Jefferson, okay, who can help you. You know, you're short on crops this year, you're short on seed, you need a little help. Uh, he's there to assist you uh, on this occasion. Uh, he can perhaps loan you that money that you need, that, uh, without which uh, you couldn't purchase an additional piece of land. And to do that, these are not just strictly business deals. There is still this element of personal contact that, well, you know, here's Jefferson or whomever the great plantation owner is in the area, and I've always uh, spoken well of him, and when issues have been debated about public policy, I've always been a supporter of his viewpoint. He knows that I'm loyal to his interests, so that when I go looking hat in hand for a couple of bucks, he'll say yes. Whereas, if I chose to be truly independent and criticize him for being an oaf, um, he's not going to lend me the money. This is a business deal, but it's not strictly business. There is always this issue of dealing with one's betters if you want to get along and if you want to move ahead in society. That's what we mean by a patrimonial society. This goes up and down the food chain, if you will, of society. If you want to move up, you always have to be looking up above you to the persons that are over you, establishing contacts, assuring them of your support and loyalty so that when the time comes and you need their help, they'll be there for you. This same kind of system can be seen in the political order. A famous case is that of Thomas Hutchinson, who was lieutenant governor and later governor of Massachusetts. Hutchinson was a member of the American elite. His family was part of the American elite. But ultimately, to get the position that he held, he had to have patrons. He had to have the support of well-to-do members of the British establishment because it was the crown, ultimately, that was going to appoint him to these positions. And indeed, Hutchinson was despised by many others, leaders eventually of the American Revolution, people like Otis and others, uh, because they believed he had benefited unfairly in this process, that his family had essentially squeezed out or pushed aside other distinguished families in securing these kinds of benefits for him. 
So he would be despised because he was seen as benefiting to an excessive degree from this patrimonial order, the system of patronage. Now, this system goes beyond just you know, the plantation owner and the smaller farmer, the local member of the elite becoming governor through patrons in England. It really filters down and affects all of American society, including the American family. American families were patrimonial orders in their own right. The yeoman farmer was a patron. Now, at this time, in the years before the Revolution, most people would probably not see themselves, most farmers, as hard-driving entrepreneurs, capitalists, making as much money as they can to reinvest in their own property and to become consumers of goods. There was some of that going on. But one thing that would drive them, as far as being hardworking and accumulating property, was their responsibility to their family. Uh, a key function that every yeoman farmer saw was to provide land for his sons. That if indeed they're going to have a future, one of the things that they will need is for him to acquire land that he can then give to them so that they can get a decent start in life. It's sort of the 18th century version of put your money aside so you can give your kid a decent college education. You've got to get him started right. He has to have the tools to start off. You don't want him starting off as an uneducated, you know, layabout, uh, as they would say back then. You've got to give him some resources. And remember, it's him, not her, because, you know, your daughter, your daughter will be taken care of because you'll marry her off to somebody else's son who has been given land, etc. So how are you going to take care of this uh, offspring? You're going to uh, endow him with some resources. If in our day it's education and maybe a down payment on a house, in those days, it was a piece of land. But what that means, in addition, this isn't just, well, gee, son, here you are, here's the land, go have a heck of a life. That land is closely proximate to your own property, and that son will be eternally beholden to you. How did I get this land? Dad gave it to me. So when Dad needs help, you know, on the land, on his piece of property, you bet you're going to scurry over there, you know, with whomever you have working on your land, and help him out. When dad isn't perhaps quite up to taking care of the property, you'll really work two jobs. You'll take care of your own and take care of his property as well. That relationship of patron and the gift receiver of that patronage uh, will remain throughout his lifetime, the lifetime of your father. He will have enormous influence over you. And of course, in terms of a daughter, he's the one that got enough money so you could have some kind of dowry, so you could m marry the right kind of man. Therefore, you owe him as well. You may move physically away, but you are always under his thumb one way or another, whether daughter or son, because he is the great patron. He is the one that has provided for you, given you your start in life. So his opinion is to be valued. He is to be looked upon you know, with great respect. And of course, before you reach the age of adulthood, this goes doubly true, that you always respect your father. So we have this system, this patrimonial order that runs all the way down through society into family relationships. And there are also legal provisions that assure the continuation of this process, particularly for the well-to-do. A uh, system's called primogenitor and entail. Primogenitor was the idea that you leave your property to your uh, eldest male heir. One of the things that concerned people who built great estates was that they would be carved up. If they had four sons, each son takes a piece of the estate. Next thing you know, each son is really a yeoman rather than a plantation owner because he has only one quarter of the wealth that daddy had. Well, one way of presenting that is to take the bulk of the estate and give it to the eldest. Sounds terribly unfair, but the idea was that that eldest son was to take over and fulfill the role that the father had. He now becomes the patron of the family. He has the wealth, and his younger brothers will be beholden to him for whatever resources he can give them to assist them in their lives. Entail worked in a somewhat similar fashion. The idea was uh, a legal provision that would keep the estate intact. 
that it could not be broken up in future generations, that suddenly your son or his son could not suddenly decide, well, I'd rather be more democratic about this and break up the estate and give a little peace to everybody. No, no, <laughs> we have a legal provision. It's a little bit like leaving your children with a trust that says, look, this is how the money will be used. Here's my retirement account, and you can have 10000 a year from it, but you cannot divide it up among your siblings and say, okay, we're each taking a piece and going. No, no, it's going to be held together. That's what entail. Uh, was designed to do. So legally, these legal provisions help preserve and reinforce this patrimonial system, this top-down system, where particularly males uh, who head families, uh, who are farmers, who are plantation owners, etc., have control and have below them family members who are beholden to them, who are dependent upon them. Now, of course, not all of American society fitted into these kinds of descriptions. First of all, there are half a million Africans who are in bondage, who are slaves in the colonies, and their numbers are growing. Their ranks are swelling year by year as the plantation economies of the South expand. And slavery exists in the North as well, just not as many slaves in the North as in the South. There are also, over the years, hundreds of thousands and then several million people who come as indentured servants, who get their passage paid to the New World in return for serving as servants uh, for six, seven years, contracts varied, uh, supposedly after which you would be free to go on your own uh, and make your own way. So this is a way of getting to the new world, getting started at least, you know, learning your way about while you served uh, some well-to-do family, perhaps as a coachman, perhaps as a house servant, what have you. So there's a significant part of the population that is in this status. Uh, Obviously, they are not nearly as badly treated or uh, as uh, facing as dark a future as slaves were because, of course, there was no, virtually no hope uh, for people in slavery. But nevertheless, they too were in a type of bondage, albeit temporary. And this is something we have to come back to because uh, whatever the revolution has to say about freedom and in, you know, the rights of the individual, there's a significant portion of the American population, including slaves and women in general, by the way, who will be largely unaffected. You know, yeah, everybody's equal except half of the American population. We'll come back to that and see, to some degree, how it's resolved over time. Now, there are forces eating at this system, forces that are starting to disrupt it, that are going to bring change. First, the internal factors, what's going on within the colonies to bring change. One of them is commercialism. I said the vast majority of yeoman farmers are just that. They're subsistence farmers. They grow crops to support themselves. If they accumulate money, it's usually to invest in more land so they can give it to their children, etc. But as time goes on, as urban centers grow, the degree of commercial agriculture is growing as well. More people are moving in that direction to raise crops for the simple purpose of selling them, to get into the marketplace, to acquire money, coin of the realm, uh, and be able to invest it. So we're moving away from purely or primarily subsistence agriculture towards commercial agriculture. We see one of the reasons for this in the great population explosion that occurs in the colonies as the population in the colonies doubles every 20 years. Partly high birth rates, partly an issue of continuing immigration into the colonies. But this is putting tremendous pressure on one aspect of this patrimonial society. You remember the idea was you have a piece of land, your daddy and the family, you save up, buy another piece of land, give it to your son, your sons, etc. With a growing number of children to try to provide for, male heirs in particular, and with the growth of population, it's becoming harder and harder to acquire enough money to provide land for all of them and to find land that is anywhere in close proximity or affordable for them. So this is putting a pressure on the system because if the father can't fulfill that role, if he can't provide you uh, with that piece of land to get started, that undermines to a degree uh, his status as the great patron of the family. Yes, you still respect him and love him, but you may well say, look at that, <laughs> you haven't got too 
shillings to rub together, and you're not able to buy me a piece of land, I have to go off on my own to the wilderness and do the best I can, okay? Uh, I can't wait around hoping that by the time you're 50, by which time you'll probably be dead, uh, that you'll have the money to provide me with land. So I'm going to have to strike out on my own, which means I'm not going to have that same dependence upon you that I would have had if you had given me a piece of land. So the simple fact that it's becoming more difficult to go on with this process that had continued through the generations of acquiring new lands and turning them over to your children and maintaining this patron-dependent relationship, that is beginning to be undermined in part by this tremendous population explosion. In addition to loosening this sort of patriarchal relationship, we also see the rise of consumerism. Now, it's important to put this in perspective. You know, nobody's opening malls yet. Uh, it's a little early for that. And when, if we were to look at it, and we were to look at colonial America at this time, uh, we certainly wouldn't see this as a consumer society. I mean, it would still look very spare and spartan to us. But when you visit, let us say, the home of oh, uh, the local parson, you know, the local minister, who is a fairly important figure in the community, but probably not that wealthy. He's certainly not, nowhere near uh, the wealth of the largest landowners in the neighborhood and certainly uh, nothing compared to the great merchants or plantation owners. Uh, nevertheless, you'll find that his house is well built. Uh, the, this is not a log cabin. This is not some roughly hewn shack. Uh, these are finished woods. You see that he actually has floors uh, that are elevated above uh, the cold ground, that he has finished furniture, some pottery, maybe some glassware, glass windows. Uh, his clothing, as well as the clothing of his family, is well done. And much of this has been acquired by purchase. This would be very basic to us. I mean, we're talking, okay, housing, furniture, you know, clothes. But these, this idea that not everything is going to be made by hand by you anymore, that you're going to acquire some goods, and that, well, you certainly don't want to engage in ostentatious shows of wealth, that nevertheless there is some value to acquiring material goods and displaying your ability to acquire them, that is beginning to affect American society. Uh, people are working in part now, uh, not just to subsist and not just to provide uh, for their children, but also to enjoy certain material comforts. That type of consumerism is on the rise at this time in American society. American society is also becoming uh, what I call here a contractual society. The bonds of family ties certainly have not disappeared by any stretch of the imagination. But more and more, as the population becomes more mobile, partly by necessity, given population expansion and the fact that no family farmers cannot always provide land for their children, as that goes on, there is a growing movement towards relationships that are based not on personal ties, not on family ties, but more on contractual relationships, the kind of thing that we understand in our modern society uh, as the primary, the dominant type of relationship. You're in this class, whether you're here in the classroom, out a hundred miles from here watching this tape, you've essentially entered into a contract here. Uh, you said, well, I'm going to pay whatever it costs, tuition, fees, etc., to take this course. Now, you don't know me from a hole in the wall, and I don't know you, most of you can't even see. <laughs> But we do have a contractual relationship. I'm supposed to come in, provide you with information on this subject, provide you with instruction, provide you with exams, objective grading. You, in return, are expected to watch the lectures, study, prepare the materials that you need for the grading instruments, and in the end, gain knowledge and a grade. That's a contractual relationship. You don't care who I am. You don't care, you know, what I do with my spare time, okay? Whatever I do, okay, whether I go out and collect coat hangers, do you care? No. Doesn't make any difference. As long as I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing here. Just as, in your case, I don't care what you do. Maybe you collect coat hangers too, but it makes no difference. I'm simply going to grade you on what you give me. That's a contractual society. In most of our relationships, 
in a modern society are that type of relationship. You, know, you go to get your car fixed. All right? Again, you don't ask the mechanic to show you his teeth, you know. If you get good dental work, you know, before I go working on my car, I really don't like people who don't have good dental work. You just want to know, has he got a sign up that says he's a licensed mechanic? All right, and if he does a good job, fine, he'll continue to get your business. These relationships are growing in number, where people, instead of relating simply by, look at, this is the town I live in, this is the family I belong to, this is the large landowner that I owe something to, more relationships as American society becomes more mobile become contractual relationships. In other words, it's more or less a business deal. I'm going to do something and you'll do something. We agree that this is what we're going to do and this relationship is based on some objective need we each have. That is becoming more and more the case in American society. And finally, something that I call here the new republicanism. Well, the leaders of the revolution, people like Washington and Jefferson, etc., are, are believers in republicanism and believe in the rights of people to have a say in how their system works and how it should function. They still believe, in the end, that whatever new world they may create will still be one where gentlemen are given proper deference where we respect the opinions of our betters, our social and economic betters. But there are people, particularly people on the frontier, who are beginning to question this. In other words, now everyone has a right to their opinion and his opinion, her opinion is just as good as mine. And who should hold office in a political system in the future? should be based simply on, well, if you've come forward with a good set of ideas and we like your ideas and you seem to be capable, fine. Even maybe you were born in poverty and have uh, up to now managed to make only modest gains and don't have a great deal of education, certainly not the education of the elite, that's fine. As long as you seem to be the kind of person that we want in office, that's the kind of person we're going to elect. These kinds of ideas are also starting to filter into American society. That now, we don't always have to listen to the, our betters, this aristocracy of gentlemen. Perhaps the common man, the common person, has as much right as anyone else uh, to have a say in the political process. Now those are some of the internal forces that are shaping and reshaping American society at this time. But there are also external forces having to do with the British Empire. what I call here, and what was referred to by a distinguished Englishman of the time, that bloated leviathan, meaning this giant creature that is bloated beyond any natural or seemly size. What does that mean? Well, here on the outline you'll see listed a series of wars. Okay? War of the Spanish Succession, the War of the Austrian Succession, the Seven Years' War. What they all boil down to are wars between the French and the British, essentially, over who would have the dominant empire in the world. Would it be the British or the French? And of course, versions of these wars were regularly fought in the colonies in North America. In undertaking this venture to battle the French, literally globally, in the 18th century, the English government took on an enormous burden of expense and debt to fight these wars, however successfully they may have fought them. And to deal with that debt, the English, after their success in the Seven Years' War, and there they have essentially defeated the French and drove them from North America, uh, the effect of this, especially Canada, was that the British now, more than ever, were going to try to secure the resources to reduce this debt and to make the management of this growing empire uh, really possible, to be able to manage debt, to be able to fund the costs of empire. This was their goal as a result of their success in the Seven Years' War. 
Now, almost immediately, we know that this is going to be a problem in the North American colonies because many of the great merchants of North America, John Hancock among them, uh, have already had to deal with uh, this system of mercantilism that the English had created, meaning this, that trade was essentially a closed system between the North American colonies and England. Certain goods had to be shipped in British uh, containers, or British ships, I should say. Goods had to pay certain taxes or import duties when they arrived in England, taxes on things like tobacco, etc., that this was a tightly controlled international economy uh, that the North American colonists had to deal with. And it worked inevitably to the benefit of the mother country, of England. Well, now that system is going to get even tighter and more burdensome. Uh, the British would say, look, we've hardly done anything. You know, we, we hardly take any taxes from you, and it's cost us a fortune over the years to defend you during these wars, uh, to send soldiers and to send supplies. We're bearing all the costs of empire. It's about time you bore some of those costs as well and bore the costs of your protection. So that's the British viewpoint. The American viewpoint is, look, you're always putting up obstacles to trade, and we always have to get around them. People like John Hancock uh, were famous as smugglers. Uh, most great American merchants at one time or another were smugglers. It was their way of getting around this closed economic system and making a profit for themselves. So right from the start of this imperial reform that begins with the end of the Seven Years' War, we know that there's going to be a conflict on this very basic economic level. Are you going to burden us with more taxes? Are you going to make the international trade system even more restrictive than it already has been? Here we see laid out a series of events, starting with the Treaty of Paris in 1763 that ends the uh, Seven Years' War, that accelerate this conflict uh, and accelerate it and expand it beyond just the issue of the trading system. As the British begin to engage in reforms from their perspective to help them better manage this imperial system. One of the problems they face after the Treaty of Paris, after the solution of the uh, Seven Years' War and their defeat of the French, is Pontiac's rebellion, rebellion by Indians in the western frontier against the British and against the colonists. There are a variety of reasons for this rebellion. One has to do with the changing conditions of the fur trade uh, in North America. But what is equally important uh, was the realization by many Indians that these white people were not going away. And more and more of them kept coming. That yes, they had dealt with you know, the Europeans for generations, but they kept coming in greater and greater numbers and trying to displace the Indian population that this was not something that could be resolved with a treaty, with a temporary solution. And now they felt that only an all-out assault on the European settlements uh, would provide a solution. And indeed, at times along the frontier, it did appear that the frontier outposts and much of colonial America might fall to the Indian uprising. The importance of this is that the British resolved that this was not to happen anymore. They had just gotten through the Seven Years' War, and now they had to deal with Pontiac's Rebellion. And as a result, they issued a proclamation in 1763 which set the Appalachian Mountains as the western border of the colonies. Okay. British colonists, residents in the North American colonies were not to move for settlement purposes west of the Appalachians. Essentially, if you think of the 13 colonies, the 13 states that they now are, uh, they were not to go any further than that. They were to stay essentially along the eastern seaboard. And why? Because the British didn't want to be antagonizing the Indians. They did not want to face additional costs in putting down additional Indian rebellions. This, again, just as with the tightening of the international commercial system, was an anathema to the settlers in the colonies. 
Remember, population is expanding. The issue of getting access to land is a major issue. And here, the British government is suddenly telling them, and many of them had already crossed that border anyways, that they can't do this anymore, that they can't secure new lands for settlement, that they are essentially going to be confined to the eastern seaboard. This ran totally contrary to the interests of the colonists. Then came the Revenue Act of 1764, which is definitely a tightening of their international commercial system. New enumerated goods, what does that mean? It means those goods, there were already certain enumerated goods which had to be shipped in British vessels okay, to ensure that they would go only to Britain. And this was always more expensive than being able to put them on any carrier that was available. So this means an additional cost to the American colonists. New import duties on goods that are coming into the colonies. Then the Currency Act of 1764, which required that paper money issued in the colonies could only be used for the purposes of paying the public debt. So why should we care? Why did they care? Because money, cash money, currency, was always in short supply in the colonies. And one of the ways they had resolved this was by the local provincial governments issuing paper money. So there'd be money for local commerce, etc. However, the British saw this as undermining the value of their own currency and creating other economic problems. Therefore, they were trying to prohibit its use in day-to-day -day commerce. Again, this is seen as another blow to the colonial economies. These measures in Boston, one of the principal ports of the colonies at this time, set off a boycott. The British merchants announced that they're going to boycott all British goods. This is their counterattack to the British tightening up their own international commercial system. What follows are a sequence of events in which the British government will try to impose new regulations, sometimes simply to gain revenue, sometimes to effect, effectively punish uh, the colonists, and the colonists responding and the conflict escalating steadily. The Stamp Act of 1765, for the first time, documents, any document generated internally within the colonies had to bear a stamp, and that stamp cost money. It was a tax. So no matter what, if you wanted to publish a newspaper, if you wanted to make out a will, whatever it was, a sales receipt, had to have a stamp, had to pay a tax. This is seen as really the first internal taxation imposed upon the colonies. Up till now, commerce, international commerce, was regulated, enumerated goods, import duties, but now they're taxing activity inside the colonies itself. In New England, we see the rise of the Sons of Liberty, an organization uh, designed to counter British control, to create, essentially, uh, a form of propaganda denouncing British rule to rally the local population in acts of civil disobedience. At one point, they burned down the governor's house in Massachusetts, which is a fairly significant act of civil disobedience. Uh, and generally, and when this time went on, to spy upon British, the British activities in the colonies. Now, one of the things we mentioned about revolutions is that very often what we have in these situations is governments which act towards reform but act ineffectively. And in many ways, the British government fulfills that kind of model. They are trying to reform their imperial system, make it pay better, but when they run into resistance, yes, they try to penalize the colonists, but they usually then wind up backing off. This was the case as the, a colonial boycott is established now up and down the colonies. Uh, against British goods as a result of the Stamp Act. And as a result of that, the British back off and eliminate, repeal the Stamp Act. Then they come back with new regulations, uh, the Quartering Acts, which would require local governments to provide housing for British troops stationed in the colonies, another way of bearing the expense of empire. Let the local colonists pay for it. And the Towns of Duties, which are new duties on trade, try to generate more revenues. We see in return mounting discontent in the colonies, the Boston Massacre, which is not really a massacre, 
uh, when British troops one night uh, stationed in Boston are essentially attacked by a local mob, having rocks and bricks thrown at them, and finally shots are fired, uh, three of the demonstrators are killed, and this is portrayed as a massacre uh, of innocents by the British government. Beyond that, uh, the Boston Tea Party, as most of you have seen in uh, American history books, in 1773, the dumping of tea into Boston Harbor. Uh, in an odd way, it's actually uh, a protest against lower taxes. What uh, the British government had been doing for some time is supplying tea to the colonies through a monopoly company. You remember these from the English Civil War. Well, they still existed, uh, particularly the East India Company. However, by this time, the East India Company was on its last legs. It, its monopoly was being seriously undermined elsewhere in the world. And to try to salvage what they could out of it, uh, the British government decided to dump uh, what it could of East India tea at low prices in New England. And the reaction of the local population is precisely against this kind of activity, that what they're really trying to do in the end by dumping this tea is preserve the monopoly. So it is, again, against these actions by the British government to monopolize the international commerce of the colonies that people are protesting. And then, of course, a series of events uh, that mark the actual violent stage of revolution. The Battle of Lexington and Bunker the Battles of Lexington and Bunker Hill in Massachusetts in 1775, and then the outbreak of the Revolutionary War itself. And finally, the uh, coming of peace. And I should point out, by the way, that uh, in terms of the revolution itself, the revolution certainly would have been lost without international intervention, uh, namely the support of the French government. Uh, which really salvaged uh, the American uh, Continental Army. Without French assistance, the Americans simply would not have had either, one, the weaponry, uh, because the French su helped supply a great deal of that, or two, the naval power to eventually defeat the British. So we have foreign intervention here. And why do the French intervene? Well, not because they want to see a republic created uh, in North America, because they want to get even with the British. Now, this is a way of, remember, they lost Canada to the British in 1763. Now they can watch gleefully as the British lose their colonies in North America, those 13 colonies south of Canada, uh, in this revolution. And this is important uh, in several ways. One, we're going to come back in later revolutions and look at external influences, not just in pressures that bring about revolution, but external influences that help revolutions succeed. But more importantly, on the immediate, our immediate concerns is that when we get to the French Revolution, this decision by the French monarchy to intervene in the American Revolution is one of the things that helps set off the French Revolution eventually, is their intervention in the American Revolution. We'll see how that comes about later. Now, as important as these events are, whether it's the you know, colonial boycott, the Boston Massacre, Lexington and Bunker Hill, the real critical issues here in terms of revolution are what came out of all of this, what came out of the violence and the upheaval when the British are finally defeated uh, and withdraw and a national government is created. We can certainly see some of the basic effects, which are known far and wide, in these documents, the Declaration of Independence in particular, emphasizing the idea of independence and the right of equality that people enjoy, that one, ties are being broken with the old colonial order. Here is the clearest statement that establishes beyond doubt that, yes, indeed, one of the major factors in the American Revolution was this anti-colonial issue, to throw off British rule, that the American colonies had been evolving on their own, that these people, as much as they may have once seen themselves as subjects of the English crown, no longer viewed themselves uh, in that fashion and that they were creating an independent entity. And of course, the question of equality, uh, that all men are created equal. Of course, as we'll see, not all men and women are necessarily created equal, including some men. We'll get back to that one. And then the Constitution, of course, and its Bill of Rights, which once again asserts these same principles uh, of the rights of the individual and of equality, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. And of course, what's most revolutionary at this time 
uh, is really the Constitution because it creates a republican form of government. This is not a monarchy. Whether you want to call it a constitutional monarchy, etc., it's not a monarchy. Okay? This is a truly republican form of government with uh, the Congress, at least the House of Representatives, being elected directly, Senate as indirect election, uh, and the president being sort of semi-directed, elected directly. But here, people casting ballots to elect their representatives who will govern them, uh, the elimination of the mon monarchical system. This anti-colonial, anti-monarchical revolution, which establishes an independent republic, those three aspects of the American Revolution are well known. Okay? Everyone accepts those as basic tenets. But another one that needs to be taken into account here uh, with the creation of the Constitution is the creation not only of a republic, but something called a nation. This, more than even the creation of a republic, was revolutionary. That these people were calling themselves a nation. Up until this time, that term really didn't have meaning. If people identified themselves, if you ask someone in England, you know, well, who are you? Other than identifying what region, you know, I'm a Yorkshire man, or I'm from this village, etc., they would say, well, I'm a subject of the English crown, even though it's a, con you know, a uh, constitutional monarchy now. Nevertheless, people still saw themselves in terms of their identification with the crown. Here, for the first time, truly is a society saying we are something different. We have no dynasty and our identification is with each other. That we share a certain common heritage, common borders, a common history, and in this case for the most part a common language. And that makes us something distinct, something unique, a nation. Again, this is a major achievement of the American Revolution and the as we go on and look at modern revolutions, we will see it becomes a major factor promoting other revolutions, the desire to create a nation, to create this new form of identity for people. Now, having talked about the major sort of political accomplishments of the revolution, you know, creating a republic and uh, establishing equal rights for people and creating the concept of nation, we also have to ask the question, what revolution? In this sense, that there remain a half a million slaves. Never mind, however, many Native Americans who had virtually no rights under the system, but African Americans are living in absolute bondage. They are treated as property. So clearly here, there is an area where the revolution really does not touch all of America, and not only African Americans and Native Americans, but women. Women have no voting rights. And their other rights within this system are acutely limited. So, yeah, this is equality. You know, all men are created equal, but the emphasis is on men, and you better be white. This is a revolution clearly limited in its impact. Another factor is this is not a situation where the old order has been thrown off and essentially eliminated. Many of the Tories, many of the people who remained loyal to the British crown, remained in the New World as, or in the New Republic, as wealthy landowners. So if this is a radical revolution, it seems to be rather limited in its radicalism. And it has not affected more than half the population and its supposed enemies uh, actually do rather well. I mean, if you're a white male and a Tory, you may well, not always, several hundred thousand did leave the colonies, but you may well wind up being able to hold on to your land, being able to stay where you are, even though you supported the losing side, whereas if you're a woman or an African American or a Native American, you didn't get anything basically out of the revolution. So this raises the questions of the limitations of this revolution, what it actually achieved. We can certainly see some other changes besides the creation of a republic and a nation state. For example, the end of empire and a monarchical society. It is certainly true that 
if the revolution did not go that far in terms of social and political rights for all Americans, it did have some other significant impacts. And what do we mean by this end of this monarchical society? The end of primogeniture and entail, meaning this process by which large estates could be preserved almost automatically by um, granting the bulk of the estate to your oldest male heir or by entailing the estate so it had to be passed on essentially intact generation to generation. So this is to an extent an undermining of that aristocracy of gentlemen. It's not going to make it impossible to survive. It's not like they disappear. They're not having their land taken away from them. But it means you are going to have to be more aggressive and entrepreneurial if you're going to preserve family wealth because it isn't just a matter of passing it on in whole. Uh, it is going to be broken up and therefore subsequent generations are going to have to be more active, uh, more entrepreneurial if their wealth is to survive. And the end of the established church. There will no longer be a state church in North America. As we said, uh, just as with the compromise uh, in the English Civil War, uh, the essential establishment of tolerance, so too in the North American colonies, the Anglican church had remained as the state church. Now it is disestablished as the state church. The Anglican church will remain, but it is simply one among many varieties of Protestantism, many sects of Protestantism that survive and flourish in the New World after the Revolution. So we have these aspects of the old monarchical order giving way. And of course, we have the fact that this really is the first nation created out of a society, that this is the first society anywhere to really define itself strictly in these terms. What makes us this separate political entity. It is not that we are part of the great empire of China. It is not that we are subjects of the Ottoman Emperor. It is not that we are subjects of the King of England. It is that we share a common heritage, a common experience, common borders, and that makes us citizens of a single nation. This may be equal to the other revolutionary achievements of establishing a Republican form of government and establishing the ideal, if not the reality, of individual equality within a society. But the revolution goes beyond those features. Those are the ones that are easiest to establish. Okay? You look at the Constitution, you look at the uh, Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and we can pretty well see most of this uh, being laid out for us very clearly. Establishment of a nation, the end of imperial rule, the uh, anti-colonial aspects of this, the rights of the individual, but there's more to it than that. That would be a revolution in itself, but there's more going on. We certainly see the end of the aristocracy of gentlemen, and this is something that accelerates rapidly during and after the revolution. Many of those who helped make the revolution, the leaders of revolution, would look back and shake their heads in the years immediately afterwards because they didn't really intend to have quite this revolutionary effect. Sure, they wanted to get rid of British rule. They wanted to establish some form of government other than a monarchy. But they still assumed that the old form, the classical form of republicanism would survive, meaning this would be a republic in which the voice of the well-to-do, the voice of gentlemen, the educated, the civilized, the economically well-off would be listened to. Uh, people like Jefferson and Washington didn't conceive of a political system in which there'd be political parties in which you would have competition. I mean, the idea would be you know, that a few distinguished gentlemen would put themselves forward, be elected, and then join something called the House of Representatives or the Senate uh, in essentially scholarly debate about how to guide the republic in the future. The idea that you would get down and dirty and have a knockdown, drag out political fight and that your opponent would be some you know, second class frontiersman like President Jackson later on, Andrew Jackson, was absolutely repugnant to these people. I mean, they saw themselves, sure, this is a republic, but you do recognize that we are distinguished individuals and deserve your respect. 
but increasingly they see that disappearing. The political process becomes more contentious, political parties like the Whig Party start to form, and they find more and more people involving themselves in the political process who are truly common, you know, who come, you know, maybe they're shopkeepers, you know, a barkeep, and he wants to run for whatever, city council, or, you know, to put himself forward as a political figure. We see this happening, this new republicanism, that the common individual, the common man at this time, is going to have a major say in the political process. We also see that with this new order, in which personal independence and personal property are emphasized, that, well, this is something, again, that the leaders of the revolution would welcome you know, the fathers of the American Republic, it really becomes a two-edged sword. Because the more that people indeed are on their own, the more that they do not owe their well-being to a patron, whether that patron is uh, a wealthy estate owner or your own father, the more that they are likely to assert their personal independence. This truly is becoming more of a society of individuals people are thinking of themselves more as individuals and establishing as their first order of priority their own individual concerns and interests. This sets off a trend that you will see working itself through the rest of American history right down to today. When we look at Americans today at the beginning of the 21st century, they are people who time and again put their own individual interests first. Yes, we talk about family and community, but the concern, the right that we celebrate most aggressively is the right of the individual. And it comes down to simple things like, well, uh, in the 18th century, uh, your father would essentially tell you, you know, you're really not cut out to be a farmer. You really should be a minister. Okay, So I'd like you to go off to school, and even though you're a dunderhead, uh, and spend a few years laboring, because that's where you, you really belong. And besides which, your brother is a lot smarter than you are in terms of money, so I know he'll take care of the estate. I'd rather see you off in a parsonage somewhere. And, hey, it was in the best interest of the family. The family patriarch had told you what to do. You went off and did it. Now, I know there are still American families where that happens, where you get told what to do with the rest of your life. But most people in this society would not accept that. You might say, well, I have to take this job because I have to support my family. I don't have any money. Sure. But simply to be told, look, you should go out and be a veterinarian, okay? You want to be a ballet dancer, but, you know, dad wants you to be a veterinarian. No, thanks. You know, horses have bad breath, too. I don't want to put up with that anymore. I want to put up with it from a human being. Most human Americans would not accept that kind of control from the top. This, again, undermines this patrimonial, patriarchal order that had existed in American society. It was starting to be undermined before the revolution. The revolution accelerates that. All of this talk of individual rights, it isn't just individual political rights. It's not just the right to ca cast a ballot. It's a right to decide what you are going to be, who you are going to be. So we see an end of the patriarchal, patrimonial society. It's rapid disintegration in the years during and after the revolution. An emphasis on equality and individualism and free association. Again, the idea of a contractual society and political order, that the relationships I create, yes, I have friends, I have family, but much of what I do, and this again is a process that accelerates through time, is based on objective decisions and relationships that I have. In other words, I'm focused more and more on objective interactions, contractual interactions with people. Uh, if you look at the late 20th century, again, as a, a striking example of this, that we spend most of our day, most of our time, most of our lives, in fact, dealing in social situations that are really free associations that are contractual associations. This may sound a bit off, but how many times do you see television comedies based on workplace environments over and over again. Why? Because this is what most people know. This is what familiar to them. This is where they spend most of their day. And what are those relationships? They're contractual relationships. Not just with your boss or the owner of the company, but with those other people in the office. 
You're there not because, oh, I love these people. You've got 20 people in your office, and you hate two-thirds of them. Okay, maybe only a third. But you're there not because of personal relationships. You're there because we have a job to do, and I relate to you and talk to you and interact with you, and we may have some social relationship, but it's really based on the fact that we're here to do a job. More and more Americans, even in the late 18th century, are finding their time increasingly focused in that direction. And people make decisions less based upon family, community, et cetera, and more upon, okay, what is my objective need here? I need an education, so I go to this institution. I need a job, so I try to go over here and do X. And I establish these kinds of relationships. And the relationships that can be readily ended. Okay? We're no longer partners in this business. We no longer find it profitable. It doesn't make any difference if we're buddies and friends. It just isn't profitable. That kind of relationship is becoming more and more common. The American Revolution was, in fact, as well, a bourgeois revolution. This is something that comes out far more clearly in the aftermath. What does the re revolution create? How do things change? When we look at, at the opening up of the American economy as a result of the American Revolution, uh, it is striking the accomplishments that are made at this time. The opening up of the Mississippi. Okay? In other words, getting rid of, remember that blockage that was placed before the American colonists by the British government? You can't move west of the Appalachians. Well, after the revolution, nobody's paying attention to that anymore. We are moving out farmers, land speculators, and we'll see more of this with the coming of the American Civil War. Uh, Americans are going to pour across the Appalachians like a great wave and sweep all the way to the Mississippi River. This is not just the achievement of people of wealth, because for many people of wealth, this kind of thing uh, was not entirely relevant. The old money, you know, the Jeffersons, the Hancocks, etc. This tends to be coming from the next level of society, small business people, shopkeepers, etc. They're the people that want to see this economy opened up in this fashion. And they're the ones that are pushing this kind of process. And they also help press forward with these ideas of building canals and road systems, a postal system. All of this has a purpose. Again, you can't have capitalism just by sitting around and waiting for it to grow. It takes the actions of a state, in this case, the new American state, to say, all right, if we're going to have a capitalist system, we're going to have this market economy with farmers producing goods primarily for the purpose of selling them on the market. You need roads. You need canals. You need communications. You need a reliable postal system. And we're going to need banks. Look at this statistic. Between 1790 and 1800, 25 banks created in the North American colonies. Up until this time, again, I mentioned earlier the scarcity of currency. When the British government tries to impose the Currency Act and limit uh, paper money issues to the payment of public debt, they're putting a crimp precisely in this entrepreneurial economy. What are we going to do about it? Because even with the British gone, the truth is there is a scarcity of credit. There's a scarcity of currency within the system. You can't start new businesses. You can't expand existing businesses without credit. Uh, why does the Federal Reserve raise interest rates a quarter point and then a quarter point, et cetera? That's because they know scarcity of money will slow down the economy. Well, back in the 18th century, the problem was not, gee, we've got an economy growing too fast because there's too much money around, just the opposite. There's not enough currency, there's not enough credit to make the economy grow. So the creation of the banking system is another step in this direction. So this is not a bourgeois revolution in terms of the great and wealthy alone, although some of them are certainly involved in it as well, but a much more broadly based group of people uh, at the second level, the second tier of family farmers who want to become uh, commercial farmers, shopkeepers, and smaller merchants who really want to expand their wealth and want the state to take actions that will lead to that expansion. And therefore, we have the creation of banks and the expansion of paper money. Now, as I said, this is not limited just uh, to the smaller groups in society. The great merchants, for example, people like Hancock and those who came after him, they will benefit from this new order. Why? Because when you do end the control of the British Empire over the international economy, suddenly it's an open field for the great merchants. They will engage in what's called re-export trade. 
now that they're no longer part of an empire, part of a colony, they can take goods from European countries and deliver those goods to those countries' colonies in the New World. They can handle goods from all kinds of countries. Most of what they're handling at this time doesn't come from the United States and isn't going to stay here. They become the great middlemen between European powers and their local colonies. At the same time, small farmers and manufacturers will flourish as a result of this new order with a new state, a new economic system, canals and roads. And finally, this will encourage an economic democracy of a sort, the right of the individual to consume. One way of expressing individualism, of course, is to have it written into the Constitution and to say all men are created equal. Another way is to give everybody an equal opportunity to gain money and to consume products. And this becomes the economic democracy, if you will, part of the American Revolution. Okay? We're going to come back in a couple of minutes, summarize all of this, and look at the second American Revolution, the American Civil War.